Hi, good day. Uh, my name is Ranjit. I'm from Dhruva uh, Advisors. I'm a partner here at Dhruva Advisors. Uh, I'd first like to uh, thank you all for joining us today and uh, welcome you to this webinar on some contemporaneous issues and uh, developments that have occurred in the GST regime. Uh, before we uh, go ahead, I'd like to introduce uh, my co-panelists and co-speakers today. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Deepak Garg, who is an IRS and uh, has been in the government uh, for 22 years and uh, a few years ago moved into the private sector and is engaged in tax adv advocacy consultancy. Uh, while in the government, he, he was, of course, uh, very closely involved with the DRI and also represented several matters before the SESTAT. Uh, in his present engagement, uh, he's uh, in, in, in the advisory position with Reliance Industries and focuses on planning and preparing for the rollout of GST. That was what he did. And uh, today he, he is, you know, in, in the advisory capacity on an overall basis. Welcome to you, Mr. Gar. Um, our our other uh, co-panelist and speaker is uh, Mr. Vikas Garg from Siemens Limited. Uh, he has an experience of, of more than 18 years uh, in in consulting and industry. Uh, previously, with uh, some of the big four uh, uh, organizations before he moved into the industry side. Uh, in his current role with Siemens Limited, uh, he is heading the indirect tax function. And uh, it's not only uh, responsible for Siemens as Siemens Limited, but also for the group companies uh, uh, for in India. Uh, his current uh, uh, role includes tax advisory, M&A activities, uh, framing of tax policies, and, and of course, tax litigation and overall governance that, that would, of course, go with you know, the, the role and responsibility that he has. My fellow uh, partners are uh, Ritesh Kanodia, who is a indirect taxes expert and uh, Mr. Umesh Gala, who is a corporate tax and uh, the regulatory side uh, expertise. Uh, so with, with that uh, sort of uh, introduction, um, I would like to make some opening remarks and, and then we would you know, sort of move forward from here. So uh, I think the first thing we, we must uh, notice is that uh, 2020 as a year will be largely remembered as a year of the pandemic. and. Uh, uh, while that is the key sort of uh, memory everyone will hold, uh, it has also witnessed in the GST regime the uh, uh, breaking of ranks, so to speak, where the GST council for the first time uh, had no consensus and where previously we saw uh, that council boasting about the fact that there has always been decision making by consensus. This was the first time where in the last year we saw uh, that not happening. And this, of course, concerned the uh, compensation uh, that the states were to receive. And uh, I, I dare say we almost. Can you be on mute? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, so as we said, as I was mentioning, that uh, we almost live to see the GST fabric being tested, and uh, today we are at a situation where I think things were, you know, controlled, and uh, we we had some sort of an arrangement being met. Uh, but as as we look at the GST provisions and the law and the scheme and the implementation, uh, there are several events and amendments, uh, perhaps uh, which have not had a deep-reaching impact. As, as those that have had previously. And, and now we will deliberate about some of those important ones. Uh, let's, let's talk about, you know, first the e-invoicing, which was a very broad based sort of uh, approach to things. And, and in, its, in its rollout also, it was broad based because it covered uh, entities and organizations which were 500 crores and above. Uh, but clearly the, I think the message that was there was that the focus of the uh, ministry, the revenue ministry or the revenue department for that matter, was on tax leakage, was on unscrupulous activities and all fraudulent practices. 
uh, after all, in, in December of 2020, we saw the GST collections hit a peak. So to say that uh, the, the revenues will flow in and what the authorities or the department or the ministry has to really focus on is to make sure that there is no leakage and there is no sort of unscrupulous activities, which is giving the GST law and implementation a bad name. So the, the deviants were what was sought to be gone after and uh, to secure the regime so that it is robust and it is as, as broad based as it could be. Now, uh, whilst that is the situation, we've heard and we've seen, and in fact, I think the, 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 the departmental officials now, of course, uh, in a manner of speaking, proudly flash the number of arrests that are made and more so in the last few months across the length and the breadth of the country and uh, involving a variety of industries and sectors and actors and uh, unfortunately i may say uh, involving certain professionals as well and and that truly is the uh, maybe the lowest uh, ebb that we will see on on these these practices uh, so now um, the the point is as we go into our our uh, for are we as we are in our fourth year and and we are going into uh, in 2022 have the five year sort of event. Um, the, the points that have come up and the developments that are of the recent times is, is what our panel will focus and discuss and deliberate upon. And some of these issues are, are, are extremely topical and extremely uh, pertinent to everyone on, on this uh, webinar today. So credit matching, uh, credit blockage, whether it is the requirement to pay the 1% in cash, or whether it is the suo motor power in some manner that the GST authorities have to block credits. Uh, the credit denial outrightedly in certain situations and certain circumstances. Uh, the entire uh, issue that is surrounding fake invoicing or that menace and how and what measures are being taken in as much as even the suppliers are, are, are of course not spared, but even the procurers of those particular supplies are then made to pay the price for it. Uh, what about automated returns? Where are we going on automated returns? When are we going to see that actually happen? Uh, I recall when, when we were introducing GST or when we were doing the implementation for GST, that was the sort of uh, uh, highlight that we would talk about. And, and now we are here talking about it again, you know, three and a half years hence. Uh, the, of course, the un, uh, unfortunate uh, situation that we are now talking about also is uh, the automated return, uh, sorry, the arrests and, and situations of bail having to be sought uh, legal interpretation is, is of course going on and, and high courts are seized of the issue. The Supreme Court is going to intervene hopefully soon. And, and what is it that it means for all of us uh, in, in, in our regular practice? Um, the other aspect which has now become a highlight in the last few weeks is the suspension of registration by the departmental authorities without in as much as even issuing a notice or calling for a hearing. And, and how is that sort of viewed and what is the implications of that? Uh, there is, of course, an interesting aspect in uh, the cross-contamination that may occur when the uh, unfortunate events of uh, fake invoicing or such other uh, transactions are there. And what could be the sort of uh, fallout in terms of the Income Tax Act or whether it is the uh, money laundering uh, provisions? Uh, that's also something that we would like to deliberate upon. Um, the convergence, I think, is as an important aspect which will come about and uh, between the two uh, arms of the revenue, whether on the direct tax side and the indirect tax side, what is the convergence that is uh, on the cards? What is the progress made on that is one of the other aspects that we would uh, discuss today. So uh, before we, uh, you know, sort of uh, go ahead and I conclude my remarks, I'd, I'd like to sort of place one specific comment on the table. And that is that as we began and we went into GST, the, uh, the, the, the focus was that there has to be a cascading effect, which must not occur. There has to be complete flow of set off. And it is in that background or on that premise that we had the entire GST, uh, you know, fashioned and rolled out. And, and in that sort of uh, promise and background, we, we, we went into GST. Uh, I think it will be interesting to hear the, the panelists provide their views on how that sort of a promise or, or that sort of a theory is today uh, coming undone or, or not. So um, I, before I invite uh, 
Tesh to sort of uh, pick up uh, the presentation and, and take us through some of the key developments in the recent times. I'd like to uh, let our uh, attendees today know that uh, there will be polling questions that we would uh, raise to you. And uh, we would like you to, uh, you know, vote on those, and so that would give us some information of of where things are in in the in the real uh, situation. And uh, when you would like to pose your questions, or if you have already uh, have some questions, do please uh, send them across to us uh, in through the chat box, and and we'll take them up as as time permits. So uh, thank you, welcome, and uh, Ritesh, would you please? Thank you, uh, thank you, Ranjit. Uh... Uh, what I what I sort of intend to do is uh, quickly uh, you know take 15 minutes to run you through what has been happening in the GST law in terms of the recent amendment, also in terms of the various notices that are being issued by the tax authorities. That would sort of give us a preface to you know get into a discussion with the experts, the industry experts uh, on on the panel and. Uh, so, so let me let me start by you know talking about you know what are the key issues which Ranjit just mentioned about uh, you know fake invoicing for example. Now there is a history to this. We had this dispute under VAT where we had an extra eight two, and there is a judgment of Maharashtra spinning and grinning mills which said that key, if you are not able to match the credits, then obviously credit would not be allowed. The entire controversy started from there, and what we are now seeing is you know there are specific provisions under the GST law which speaks about matching, uh, et cetera. There are also provisions around arrest. So section uh, 132, which has been introduced to say that in certain specified circumstances, the department can, you know, ha has the powers to arrest. We'll discuss this more when we get into a panel discussion. Credit matching restriction, we all are facing this in terms of, you know, two to a reconciliation. Section 16, two, which says that payment has to be made to the supplier. And then there are provisions, rules which have been introduced without the authority of law, which is 36.4. So 43 has not been notified, but rule 36.4, which says that your credit has to be restricted starting with 20 to 10. And now we'll see that it has got reduced to five. We've discussed about, uh, so notices, all of you uh, who are, you know, pan India presence would be receiving these notices from different states. And then we will we'll sort of go through what are the types of notices which are being issued. Uh, registration, yes, uh, has become sort of a painful process in the sense that there are two aspects. One is those who had registered before the Aadhaar based verification came into being. There are instances where physical verification is happening and registration are getting cancelled if no activity is being found. There could be genuine circumstances where actually there is a change of address and you would have, you are in the process of changing the address. We are dealing with some of those issues. Uh, another is, you know, to to sort of ensure that this fake registrations are not taken going forward. There is an entire Hadar based registration process which has been launched. E invoicing got introduced in October in the mid of uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, this is one positive step to me which has happened. Uh, we have not seen too many technical glitches on e invoicing until now. Uh, the biggest issue is for companies about hundred crore because as we hear what is happening in the industry. Uh, we we understand a lot of companies are still not prepared, still not geared up, you know, on on invoicing which are which are about hundred crores. Then there are issues around integration, etc., which we'll sort of uh, you know discuss very quickly. Uh, and amendments in law, I intend to take this up in a little bit more detail. So coming to the very recent amendments, and you would have seen a lot of news articles where you know the amendment has has, has received a lot of criticism you know why what these amendments are why this has received the criticism let us sort of quickly look at it so what 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 uh, the the provision says is that the department has the authority to cancel the registration if itc has been availed in violation of section 16 so instances which it lays down what could be the violation in section 16 obviously one is uh, invoice is not correct bogus but there could be other situations where tax has not been paid to the vendor the credit has been uh, not reversed beyond 180. So these are instances which could be considered as violation of 16. So there is an extra to be which has been launched. What an extra to be indicates is a government's viewpoint of what credit is available. There is a warning if your an extra to be does not, you know, uh, if you take a two-way credit which is beyond your an extra to be, does it mean that there is a violation of section 16? And what it talks about is simply the department has the power to cancel. Another instance is where your supplies in GSTR 3.1, GSTR 1 is more than GSTR 3B, which means effectively that you would have not paid the tax. 
now they were here it is mentioned that if there are frequent such issues arising for a taxpayer and multiple notices are being issued month on month but but we need to understand that a difference between a gstr 1 and 3b could be could be for multiple reasons genuine reasons for example if there is a excess tax paid then obviously you would adjust that in 3b you cannot adjust that in there is a negative tax balance you there is no option for me to uh, you know show a negative figure in gstr 1 it further says violation of 86b so this is the new provision which has been introduced which says that ki if you are above 50 lakhs you will have to pay mandatorily 1% tax in cash which means that you can only take 99% there are certain carve outs which i am not sort of getting into detail on what those carve outs are so for example they have said if you have paid income tax above rupees 1 lakh for the preceding 2 years then then you may not fall under this particular provision uh, you know again a lot of criticism around this to say that ki why is it that 1% cash when i could have a huge amount of accumulated credit which is lying in my books why why i should not ought to be allowed to use credit you know while while one argument is that it is only about for tax payers above 50 lakhs but say, but still it it is a cash flow impact uh the, there are amendments in the rules to provide for additional grounds of suspension and interesting to note you know how this uh, rules have been worded significant differences or anomalies now what is those differences or anomalies uh, no mention in gstr 1 b or gstr 2 a which indicate now what do you mean by which indicate again no benchmark to say that you know so for example can can the officer at his discretion come to a conclusion that your 1 to b 1 3 b comparison or 2 to a comparison indicates that there is a contravention what it then goes and says is that your notice would be issued and you have to provide an explanation within 30 days uh, refunds would be stopped if your registration is suspended and and most interestingly no ph would be granted before suspension now is this not violation of principles of natural just there could be multiple genuine reason because of it there are differences and we all seen during the last three years that there are differences can 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 the authority say that we will not give you an opportunity to be heard in, in our view this could become a huge ground of constitutional challenge to say that ki principles of natural justice is a fundamental right you cannot deny the taxpayer uh, you know a, a opportunity of being heard a uh, coming to credit restriction we we've, we've seen uh, you know 20% 10% 5% again very frequent amendments in this provision 3a which is the key relevant provision never got notified it was introduced in the amendment of 2018 we are sitting in 2020 whereas the rules which have been formed which is rule 37 have already got implemented to say that you can't take credit if your percentage of credit goes beyond a particular percentage of matched credit now the the question is you know we understand that uh, government had a reason to sort of introduce this uh, started with 20 but then reduced 10 and reduced to 5 you know all these changes are are they so easy to be made in the system how how so we are we, we are aware of clients who have taken a view that we will not not take the credit at all this is too complex for us to really implement in our system considering the huge number of invoices you know that we receive uh, rates been filed the challenging rule 36 a uh, 1% payment we've discussed where you know the payment is beyond uh, 50 lakhs in a month uh, uh, there are certain exclusions a similar provision of blocking of credit was introduced uh, by rule 86a rates have been filed on that uh, provision there is a judgment of the gujarat high court in ss industries to say that department can't just go and you know at random block credits that there has to be guideline which have to be issued under what circumstances that blockage of credit should happen uh again again you know uh, like we have uh, this provision which says that if you do not file your return for certain months your eva bill will not be allowed to be issued so this is two consecutive months now those provisions have been introduced for if you do not file your returns uh, uh if you do not file your return then gstr1 filing will not be allowed clearly an immediate consequence of this would be that if you are not filing gstr1 your customer will not, not get a Uh, you know to entry and a customer would come to you to say that look i am not able to take credit and that would be a uh, quite a disputed aspect so it says gstr 3b for two preceding months 3b for last quarter 3b for previous month depending upon the people involved uh, aadhar based aut- aut- authentication we have already spoken about it so now if you want to take a registration you will have to enter into this this is an attempt to ensure that there are no fake registrations and those who have registered are are genuine tax taxpayers 
just quickly you know we we all heard and seen this we have all gone through this entire pain of notice being received so you know i i just will quickly sort of run through and summarize uh, those notices for you so itc mismatch between 2 to 2a uh, what are the challenges with this notices there is no breakup which is given you know tax wide uh, tax head wise or itc breakup uh, gst at 2a is very make keeps on changing on a daily basis how do you sort of match up to 2a is a big question there are multiple reasons for the mismatch so supplier is maybe a quarterly return filer it on imports is not coming through credit on tax paid on rcm is not coming through obviously two two clear reasons would be non compliance or delay in filing etc so so you know on on a month on month basis you know responding to such notices has really really become challenging when these notices are issued there is no justification or no rational given in terms of from where the 2a figure has been taken Uh, other is revenue mismatch. Uh, again, uh, the notices do not consider credit note, advances, invoice amendments, and there could be multiple reasons uh, for for uh, not not reporting uh, misalignment. So obviously, I would have I could have missed out reporting some income, or there is excess tax paid earlier, which I would now be adjusting in GST accordingly. We all are aware of this interest issue now, sort of fairly settled. But we even seen now that notices are being issued. Obviously, the facts may not be exactly net interest, but there are surrounding circumstances in terms of, you know, where I would have delayed in filing the return, delayed in taking credit, and now department is asking me to pay GST. Uh, but yes, fair, you know, largely a settled issue in terms of the provisions. Uh, Uh, multiple other notices, 3B EVA bill matching uh, notices to say that why have you utilized credit beyond 90 percent or even 100 percent, so it raises a red flag. Tran one, yes, verification audits are uh, ongoing and notices are being issued. Uh, notices which are which are stating that you know your ITC, uh, you are not filing your returns. Why are you not filing your returns? Even though I may not have any. Transaction and obviously the last piece is the audit notice. Uh, we've seen a Maharashtra circular saying what information is required for the purposes of GST audit. Extremely, extremely voluminous. And when we go to the document level, we are handling some such notices. They are getting into too much of depth. You know, getting that information at a granular level for each and every state is is really becoming a painful process. We have seen. instances where garnishi notices were issued to the recipient for non payment of tax by the supplier uh, not too many notices are being issued currently but there were instances where the department went and attached the bank accounts to say that you have to now pay the tax uh, again uh, 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 the large controversy around denying itc since supplier has not paid the tax and will also apart so there now supreme court is in arise india had dismissed the petition filed by the department where the all high court has said that if the issue is bona fide purchases and not fake invoicing then the credit cannot be uh, denied interesting meant uh, we left to in the vat regime we we'll have to see how it will evolve and there are there are there's one slide on this which i would quickly take you through in terms of what could be you know how how this could evolve under gst a uh, freezing of accounts or notices denying credit on account of fake invoices uh, so uh, ss industries as i mentioned that you can't block it uh, ad hoc uh, so so uh, notices on best judge assessment, assessment to say that if you file not file the return they just go ahead and do your best judgment there are provision under the gst law which empowers the authorities to do best judgment assessment uh so you know what what we have seen uh, now uh, happening is notices received from each state even before the start of the gst assessment uh, taxpayers are really burdened with such notices month on month uh, parallel notices are being received by from dggi not only from their jurisdictional authority as you know dggi has a all india jurisdiction so what happens if there are multiple investigations or inquiries the data requirements are voluminous the time periods which are being given are short uh, the entire debate on jurisdiction state versus center and we recently saw the cbic circular uh, issued by maharashtra the circular issued by maharashtra we say cbi circular is not binding and maharashtra would analyze the cbi circular then open would issue its own set of circulars depending upon the view they want to adopt again open could could open up a pandora's box we may see other states following suit so what happens in such cases where you know there is a different viewpoint on center and state 
so so the entire you know when when gst started we we spoke about one nation one tax good and simple tax and and we'll get into a larger discussion with the panelists that are they really seeing this happening so i mentioned about you know the history on uh, credit matching so premium paper industries where the repetition was dismissed as premature saying if the entire basis of claim of set off is found upon assessment to be bogus and fraudulent though it was a, a premature dis, uh, dismissal saying it is premature uh, the relevant part is what the court observed is that if the claim is bogus or fraudulent maharashtra uh, cotton ginning the famous decision which sort of made an observation that you know when the government gives you the right of set off it is well within its powers to prescribe conditions on those set off uh we have this recent judgment in arise india and very very uh, relevant from a gst perspective which says that you know the dealer or dealers should not be interpreted to include when when i talk about denial of credit and they read down the provision to say that it would not include purchasing dealer who has bona fide enter who is not include it would not include dealer who entered into bona fide purchase transactions so if i it is established that the purchases are bogus or fraud the credit can be denied but if it is no it, it is not established by the department that the purchases are bogus or fraud then such credits cannot be denied irrespective of whether the supplier has paid tax or not you know there is already a writ petition which has been filed challenging 162 in lw lgw industries limited and the, the uh, government uh, the high court has issued notices to the central and the state government uh, clearly uh, we will see uh, you know a good amount of uh, clearly this will go to the supreme court at the end of the day uh you know when you talk about credit mismatch etc it would also be relevant to keep in mind the provisions on offenses and offenses and arrest because while you know the credit mismatch reversal notices have monetary implication there are some offenses which could have a prosecution implication so where you know if it is established that you have entered into these kind of transactions then above 1 crore you could be actually uh, be arrested and then the offenses depending upon the quantum involved are divided into uh, billable and non billable so i have highlighted those four offenses where you know the offenses become non billable so supplies without any invoice or false invoice and vs corporate clearly may not would not fall within any of these four offenses but but we just need to be mindful of the fact that tomorrow if there is an allegation you need to have enough and more evidence to establish that the supplies were not bogus the services availed were not bogus there are enough and sufficient documents which are available to come to a conclusion that the supplies are quite genuine so as i said so sometimes what happens we have seen instances where your balance credit available in one state you may just simply sit or issue an invoice to say that let me transfer the credit to another state you know that could you know raise raise an issue and apprehension to say that where are the services where are the supplies there have to be a clear apt justification of why the invoices are being raised and are there underlying transactions there could be instances where i have raised an invoice on another company and the goods and another company raised the invoice back on me now that could be because of bank limit etc but but again those transactions could enter scrutiny so so the four offenses to quickly sort of run you through which are critical are supply without invoice or false invoice issue of invoice or bill without an underlying supply itc availed on invoice without underlying supply of fraudulent itc so you know what this provision says is that it doesn't matter whether fraudulent non fraudulent there has to be an underlying supply and we all know that there are bill to ship to provision so when there is a genuine transaction of a bill to ship to you know can department sort of pick this up and and there we have seen instances where department is actually issue notices even in case of bill to ship to transactions tax collected but not paid to the government within 3 months of due date it entails an arrest now uh, what if what the law says is that if you are above 1 crore and obviously there are imprisonment uh, norms but if you are above 5 crores then the offenses become non billable and we'll will when we do go to the panel discussion we'll also sort of briefly discuss on where the supreme high court or the supreme courts are in terms of arrest and powers of arrest under section 69 uh just one uh, i would just come i want to conclude my presentation with this last slide which again becomes very relevant to corporate uh, tax heads cfos which says that who in the case of companies who is who is responsible so the person who is in charge at the time of commission of the offense uh there has been uh, recent dgga guidelines which says not to issue summons to cfos and cfo we've seen you know this uh, 
approach of uh, the authorities to straight away jump and issue notices to the managing director, the CPO, CFO, or the CEOs. And uh, the judgment in Jagdish Arora to say that mere employee statement, a person cannot be in charge and responsible. So department would have to establish that the person was involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the company and was responsible for the management of the company. Uh, with this, uh, what we would want to do is move into uh, the panel uh, discussion. Uh, Ranjit has already introduced our expert participants. I would like to invite Ranjit to sort of lead the panel and uh, open up for discussion by everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nitesh, for mentioning the work. Um, ahead of uh, going into the panel discussion and uh, you know engaging on, on that very interesting uh, set of issues, uh, I would like to sort of have that first uh, poll uh, question posed to all the attendees and uh, would like the benefit of what their uh, inputs are on that. It, it would take a minute and a half or uh, so I request everyone to just please uh, vote in. Sorry, uh, hang on. Uh, Ranjit, could you just repeat it? The, I think the voice was a little low, if you can hear me. Yeah, I, I, I just mentioned that uh, before we start in, I wanted to have the views of the attendees on the poll question, which we've just posed and it's on your screen. Hmm. I can't see the screen, the question. So. Can you say out the question? Because I can't see the question on the screen, uh, Ranjit, for some reason. Yes. So it, it is actually for the attendees. Uh, as, as a panelist, uh, you wouldn't be able oh, to. Okay, 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 fine. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it out for your uh, benefit so you're yes. aware of what you're saying. Is what's, what is the biggest challenge today that uh, one is facing in the GST regime? Uh, whether it is a frequent amendment to the rules and the system, uh, the e invoicing implementation, the GSTR 2A reconciliation, and the credit restrictions uh, under Rule 36.4. Uh, the frequency of notices from the states and from the center, of course, and the divergent advanced rulings that we are seeing uh, spread across. Thank you. Can we get the uh, sort of outcome of this? Yeah. So what, what we have is 39% uh, of the people who, who sort of voted in saying the frequency of changes in the rules and the system is, is uh, the second biggest bother. The largest bother is actually the two-way reconciliation and the credit restrictions that we have in 36.4, which, which has 43% uh, of the people, you know, sort of complaining about. Uh, quite interesting that uh, it's almost no one who had any challenge on e-invoicing implementation. I mean, that's a revelation to me, at least. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, let, let me let me first pose the, the, the first question to, to, to uh, all of you all on the panel. Uh, I'd like to just hear from you, what, what is it that, uh, you know, the three and a half odd years of GST uh, you have noticed? What is your key takeaways? What has been your experience? And uh, if you could make one or two suggestions, what would they be, you know, uh, in, in, in the overall scheme of things? Yeah. So could we could we could we go with uh, uh, Deepak, uh, please first? Yeah, uh, yeah, Ranjit, uh, thank you so much for having me, and uh, you know it's been a very interesting format, I must say, and very appropriate time when we are all grappling with you know new and new issues in GST. But having said that, uh, of course, the the poll which you had right now was very telling. In fact, it sums it up very correctly. You know, uh, frequent changes in rules uh, is at the top. Which is true, and uh, you know, and, and legal issues, I would say, and GSTR two A is number two, three, and e invoicing, and very correctly so. Uh, you know, my our experience of three and a half years has been the easiest part to implement has been e way bills and e invoicing. You know, it has actually gone up very smoothly, which maybe talks a little about the implementation agencies because these were handled by NIC, etc. Although you know, they don't have such a uh, sort of glorified past as the agency that was implementing the GSTN system. But yes, it was definitely much easier as compared to the implementation of the rest of the GST. Now things have stabilized as far as GSTN is concerned also. But in the initial two years, 
it was a nightmare as we all know uh, you know so but having said that the key takeaway for me uh, for us uh, at reliance has of course been you know it is a very good tax system uh, which has possibly be, could have been implemented better you know with the free flow of credits uh, across states with largely opening up of credits with only very minor restrictions etc so to that extent uh, it has been very good for the business you know uh, your cross border movement of goods uh, has become much easier now and uh, most of the credits are available barring some in 175 so to that extent it's been a very business friendly much needed and having a single unified tax regime you may have numerous enforcement agencies but you have a single same tax regime across the country so these have been the positives the negatives if you ask me one of course is the compliance overload you know having state wise registrations online compliances matching of invoices etc but these i feel are only very you know sort of uh, initial issues 3 years is maybe still a short time to judge them another 2 years down the line we will probably thank uh, you know the online compliances and in matching of invoices e invoicing and uh, e way bills once the system stabilize because it actually will make the compliance is much easier and as the government and the gstn is moving towards automated compliances totally you know like your gstr uh, uh, one is now getting auto populated by your irns and uh, your gstr uh, 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 your 3b you know the return the, the gstr 2b coming in telling you your returns there are gaps but once the technology stabilizes the tax payer system stabilizes i think it will be the biggest boon uh, which this tax system would have done which would have very seamless compliances the challenge where i feel you know and we, where the suggestions also lie uh, you know there are certain provisions of law you know in the structure of the tax which need to be relooked at by the policy maker or which need to be given a thought for example you know which have created unnecessary compliance burdens avoidable compliance burdens i wouldn't call uh, 2as and 3bs as compliance burdens or matching of invoices for example distinct party billing under schedule 1 you know from 111 uh, uh, you know and then there's a provision of law which says rule 28 that if all credits are available then you can choose any value now it becomes meaningless for example for a telecom major to issue invoices from one state to every other state and you know every month or every quarter i mean this is absolutely a totally avoidable tax burden uh, which which could have been avoided so one is distinct party billing and then of course and from unregistered tax payers the provision has been put in abeyance so which is which has been good and then you know it is a new tax law it is a new tax law and which has to deal with the changes or or new situations which are emerging there is no established jurisprudence so government possibly needs to come out on you know papers or clarifications on complex areas of law you know to name some for example you know which are which are uh, dealt uh, in the law in a very a uh, cursory manner uh, an inadequate manner i would say for example transfer of going concern you know there are always issues relating to what is the transfer of going concern how credits are to be distributed and in what all circumstances would part of business be transfer of going concern sales promotion schemes for retail sector has been another area of uh, great ambiguity government came out with a circular created more confusion and then withdrew that circular creating even more confusion after that because you don't know whether a subsidy how to, whether a discount is a subsidy or a discount you know it is impossible to say uh, how, how to distinguish between a discount and a subsidy uh, you know so government needs to clarify that the subsidy referred to in section 15 is a different subsidy you know the intention is not to cover discount under subsidy but you know with the, the lack of this clarity the the sword of democles keeps is, is hanging you don't know when when you get a notice an adverse notice on that ground and similarly are issues you know like relating to barters supplier defines barters includes barters now everything is a barter i go and buy something at a shop he is giving me a supply but i am also giving him a supply because i am buying something from him so the interpretations can be endless so similarly you know there are so many areas like for example another area which i find you know with uh, online services coming up uh, you know agency services you know where services are provided by a person as an agent we have deeming provision for supply of goods but we don't have a deeming provision for supply of services to an agent so all these areas are leading up to a whole lot of uncertainty in in, in tax which is what the government uh, if you ask me need need to address and of course you know uh, uh, the provisions relating to arrest and all they need to be 
uh, you know, exercise in a very circumspect manner, which we'll discuss later in the in the in the cross. But if you ask me, my two suggestions at, uh, after three and a half years of experience would be a uh, either remove uh, distinct party billings or you know use the provision of the valuation rules where that value is deemed to be nil. And second, to bring out clarity on these complex areas of law. Initially, the government did come out with a lot, lot of circulars, but now they just stopped coming out with circulars. GST Council is not meeting enough, I think. So these are the two areas which government needs to uh, address. Yes, Ranjit. Thank you. Very, very useful. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I think we should, we should have all of these sort of jotted down and sent across. Uh, I, I know you would already have, but maybe just reiterate them. Yeah. Uh, Vikas, Vikas, could I ask your uh, thoughts on, you know, what's been the takeaways, experience, and of course, the suggestions? Yeah, uh, thanks, Anjit and uh, Ritesh. So uh, let me try to put them into, uh, I mean, four different baskets and uh, uh, three years, of course. I mean, we've been seeing that how this is evolving and uh, still in the phase of evolvement. Uh, but uh, I mean, if I talk about these, uh, I mean, four baskets, one, let's, uh, I mean, say the policy, for example. Now, uh, like Deepak said, that, uh, I mean, initially it was more of a consultative approach. But if you look at maybe from last, uh, I mean, 12 or 18 months, I think somewhere the approach has changed completely. The way all these, uh, I mean, changes have been coming in uh, arbitrarily or those rules are getting changed so frequently. And that too at the disadvantage of the taxpayers. So effectively what it means is that we are going back to the situation what probably we used to have in a pre-GST scenario, which is uh, many kind of mistrust be between the revenue and the taxpayers. This is what it is, I mean, showing if, if you look at some of the recent developments. Now, uh, what it also means is something you can say that whatever the good work uh, uh, which was done before uh, implementation and post implementation, it is, I mean, looking as if that it's being undone uh, with these frequent changes and these, uh, uh, I mean, arbitrary changes, I would put it this way. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, you can say that there is still time and I'm sure that the government would uh, still take those suggestions which are coming in from the businesses to see that what can be done to simplify it. Uh, coming to the second part, which is, let's say, the administration, that's where I think, uh, I mean, we all have our own set of experiences, both good and bad. Now, I mean, to start with the positive experiences, of course, uh, I mean, the initial phases, uh, I mean, all those tax administrations, they were very approachable, consultative, and uh, were in a listening mode. But at the other set of it is, if you look at uh, some of these implementation uh, which has gone wrong probably and i mean ar could be one example there uh, i mean look at the scenario where uh, that judicial discipline doesn't mean at all uh, i mean anything to them these officers i mean everything uh, whatever grievances you may have i mean high court is the only option as a taxpayer you might have so uh, i mean if you look at n number of rulings courts are coming very heavily on uh, i mean the revenue that uh, I mean, every day they are hearing n number of cases relating to um, the bank attachment, be those uh, check post matters, I um, mean, Tranman, those uh, credit related topics which have gone into a complete, uh, I would say, uh, uh, I mean, wrong direction. So somewhere, uh, I mean, someone needs to tell the revenue authorities that what is that they want to achieve with this. Because when we talked about, when we initiated this implementation, it was treated as a, I mean, good and simple tax. Now, can we really say it to be the same fashion after three years of implementation? Well, I would have my doubts on that. Now, the third piece may be on the compliance side. This, of course, uh, I mean, barring few glitches here and there, uh, uh, I mean, still acceptable. And I mean, with this invoicing and new changes which are coming in, of course, that require a lot of backend working which needs to be done uh, at all corporates level, all companies whosoever needs to comply. But uh, I mean, I mean, given the change, the uh, uh, volume of change, what we had, uh, it is still acceptable. The last part which I put in is on the litigation front. Like I said, uh, I mean, for everything now you have to go to a high court. That's the only solution. This is where, uh, I mean, I mean, it's a complete attempt now. Now we don't have a complete appellate mechanism in place after three years of implementation. So as a taxpayer, it's not as if that you can, I mean, go to high court for each and everything. Uh, I mean, Again, it, it is a bit of, uh, I mean, dampener. Someone needs to see that where is it that, uh, uh, I mean, pain causing uh, from the revenue authority side? Is it from the taxpayer side? And how do we balance it out? On the suggestion side, uh, I mean, I, I think Deepak has summarized it very well, but uh, 
apart from the compliances, which is let's say the routine thing, uh, some of these, uh, I mean, recent simplifications, uh, which should have been expected. I mean, the 17.5 thing, for example, these credit mechanism, m and related topics, these are typical burning issues. Now, uh, of course, we hope that, uh, I mean, the government still listen to this and I mean, come up with some sort of solutions, suggestions. And uh, uh, while we, of course, I mean, have as, as corporates, we have that responsibility or owe it to the government also that we, uh, I mean, we participate in this, uh, I mean, consultative approach. But yes, uh, we, we hope, do hope that the government is also in a listening mood to say that, yes, these are the things which can be further improvised. Thank you, Vikas. That, that's yeah, just we... one, one second, Ranjit, just, you know, just to add, and you know, I got a cue from what Vikas said. Please. One suggestion, which I, you know, which we always feel that since it's a technology law, you know, which is technological compliances, online compliances, we should have what is called a technology audit of the law, a technology friendly law, so that, you know, the government sees that the law is easy to implement technologically. You know, for example, the 17.5 could easily be defined in terms of specified HSNs, one, two, three, four, uh, that this is not allowed. You know, when you say transportation, but for this purpose, and without this purpose and 13 people or more, et cetera, you're you know, creating uh, compliance impossibilities and you know, making difficulties in uh, technology and in sort of uh, automation of the process. So we must, government must undertake a technology audit that how is it to implement and, uh, you know, in terms of technology and then imp and give that law. You know, have straight five negative headings, period, nothing else. So technology index is what I hear you to say, uh, Deepak. Yeah, the technology audit. Yeah, what do you say, technology? Technology index. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll be, life will be so much easier. I, I, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. But thank you so much, uh, Deepak and Vikas. Uh, very, very insightful and, and sharp comments from you all. Uh, Ritesh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that uh, you know, set of points. Ritesh, uh, you're, you're on mute. Uh, Ranjit, uh, having heard uh, both Deepak and Vikas, two interesting uh, sites of the very same coin one is the entire administrative issues you know and another is uh, the entire tax issues uh, very interestingly in the industry conference when eminent lawyer actually stood up when questions were being asked about on matching to say that why are we raising these issues in the conference these are not tax issues these are technology issues so so you know interestingly you know while interpretation of law department has not even picked up not even raised those issues we have we have all left that as side and Deepak raised this point which have not come in question in terms of any audit etc. Some few circulars here and there but the uh, industry just got boggled with you know uh, other issues which are which are very very different issues. You know whether my matching will happen, whether my reconciliation is happening, whether my technology is apt or not. Very 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 interesting you know very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why the technology index and uh, technology audit, as as Deepak suggested. So, so. Ranji, just one one recent discussion where I think uh, one of the interviews somebody mentioned that you can't now be a tax professional. You have to be a tax technology professional. All round, all round. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let us move on from there. Uh, the government as Ritesh, as you had also just, you know, sort of articulated in that presentation and slide deck has uh, had several amendments, uh, especially relating to input tax credit. Now, whether it is matching, it is blockage, it is suspension and whatnot, and, and payment in cash or for minimum amount, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the core sort of objective or the, 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 the basis from which they are coming, it seems to be is the entire uh, unscrupulous activities, fake invoicing at all. Now, uh, the GST provisions, therefore, if I could, you know, sort of describe it is in two parts. It's the non-availability of credit if the tax is not paid or the certain conditions which are in the statute, which are not uh, met. And then there is the uh, reversal or blockage or, or, you know, sort of barring of the credit on account of mismatch or certain other sort of events. Now, uh, Ritesh, you mentioned about Section 43A of the CGST Act, which is not yet notified. But Rule 36.4 is now, you know, there in full force, uh, which previously, in fact, gave you a 20% sort of uh, upside, 10, and then now is down to 5. So my, my question first to, to Deepak is, uh, you've seen both sides from the government and, and now, of course, from the corporate side. Uh, the service tax law did not have such a provision. 
uh, this provision essentially comes up from the VAT laws that we've had. Uh, how do you see this from a business perspective? Uh, Deepak, you'll have to unmute, please. Sorry, Randy. Uh, you're right. Uh, service tax, excise did not have these provisions. But uh, all of us who've seen those times, and you know, I've seen it from the department side, all of you have seen it from the other side. We all remember the drama that used to go on the last day, one day before 31st of March, you know, when the superintendents would go out and pick up the VAT, the send VAT registers. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it used to be so rampant and, you know, so open and accepted. And, uh, you know, this is precisely what it is. Now, you know, the government has legalized that lifting of VAT registers or uh, says or not VAT registers, the uh, RG23 part two, by imposing a restriction of 90, you know, 5% or 10%. So uh, this is, a, you know, prob probably, a, you know, a government's concern for revenue, which we can't, you know, wish away, you know, which we can't wish away. A government is, is right in, in being concerned about revenue and particularly where the response of some of the, uh, you know, recalcitrant uh, sections of the trade has been so, so, so uh, openly fraudulent. You know, so therefore, one, one cannot uh, deny the government's concern that that's, that's number one. So government, I guess, is justified in taking whatever actions they're taking. Having said that, I think the manner in which it has been implemented has been rather, you know, if I can use the word, uh, no, you know, not so legally sustainable, you know, to use the diplomatically word for clumsy. Because you can't have a provision of law in the rules which is not enabled by the act. You know whether it is uh, 36 4 or even for that mat matter invoice matching if you ask me has no legal feet to stand on today because you go to section 42 or section 43 you know for invoice matching that if there is a mismatch then the government is supposed to communicate gstn is supposed to communicate the mismatch to you within 30 days for a certain amount of time and then that amount has to be added to your output tax liability but those mechanisms were never uh, enabled right so therefore, where, where is the basis for denying credits on the basis of invoice uh, uh, mismatches? 43A section they tried to bring in, which has not been notified. But uh, you know, uh, even, even with that, there could be legal challenges because substantive provision of section 16.2 only deals with that the tax ought to have been paid and uh, the person should have received a goods or services. So as long as I can prove that the tax has been paid, because invoice matching could, as we've seen, happens because of several other factors. You know, uh, supplier loading it, uploading the invoice details from a wrong registration, uploading your registration number wrong, you know, or having some invoice number uh, mismatch. So therefore, all those issues come into invoice mismatches, which do not actually go to the substantive issue of payment of tax or uh, you know, non-receipt of services. But having said that, I think, you know, uh, as far as this provision of restricting the credits to 5% of unmatched invoices, of, 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 of unmatched invoices of total credit, is of course uh, a little onerous, particularly on the MSME sector, you know, and, uh, and particularly where you have, now government has given this facility of, you know, uh, uploading of invoices on, on, on a regular basis uh, to, to, the, uh, to the medium scale sector. But earlier, the invoices were not even available after up to two months, you know, till one day before the end of the quarter, one month before the end of the quarter. Right. So those issues are there, and I think, and and for the government to have come out with the through through, through delegated legislation, I think is uh, it does not send a good signal. It's open to challenge, and now that the revenues are going back and doing well, I think government should seriously review these provisions, particularly of 36.4, because. It is not the uh, large taxpayers that it impacts too much. You know, honestly, it does not because, uh, you know, we, we have put in place our checks and all, uh, you know, like, for example, taking credits only on the basis of matching, et cetera. But for a small taxpayer, medium scale taxpayer, they can be quite onerous. So they definitely need a review uh, of uh, the 36.4. And even that percentage, 1% cash payment, you know, uh, is, I think, a little arbitrary, uh, 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 you know, considering the condition. No, thank you. Thank you, uh, Deepak. I think uh, you, you've sort of laid out the length and breadth of all the issues that are there around uh, these provisions and these amendments. So in, in that sort of a backdrop, uh, Vikas, may I just seek your input 
on uh, what is it that as you know the the corporate side you're doing uh, whether it's related to managing this entire reconciliation system uh, it related steps uh, holding vendor payments for example you know could you share with us what what you are facing and how you are sort of tackling uh, and and uh, after you i would also like to have uh, deepak's inputs on on those sort of steps and measures yeah uh, sure uh, ranjit so in fact before i comment on this let me just add on to some of the points what uh, i mean deepak had raised and uh, uh, I, i want to go back to maybe a bit uh, in a pre gst situation now uh, one part is that the expectation from the government side is that it should be a complete matched credit i mean it has of course gradually uh, i mean gone from 100% to then uh, 20 10 5 and maybe in uh, near future it may be in within the rules itself they may bring in uh, this zero 100% matching but uh, look at the scenario from the government side what is expected to be done so apart from those uh, in operational sections 43 uh, i mean in pre gst we have uh, heard about this mahalakshmi ruling from bombay high court which was uh, uh, upheld by supreme court and this arise india ruling which is uh, uh, in favor of the sc so both on the same topics but very contrary rulings of course uh, i mean as a taxpayer you still need to i mean decide that which one suits you better Uh, second piece is, uh, I mean, that negative ruling of Mumbai High Court. If you look at the uh, commitments or the, uh, uh, I mean, suggestions which were given by the court and uh, uh, government, in fact, uh, uh, committed to this that they would still make a try to recover all that disputed tax on unpaid tax from the defaulting suppliers, and the moment they get it, they will pass it on back to the sellers to whom that legitimate credit has been denied. Now I have my doubts because. Uh, Uh, I mean, at least I have not seen in my experience government coming back to you and saying that, okay, I had disallowed you this much of credit, and within next three to four years, I am sure that it's not uh, a zero collection from those defaulting taxpayers. I mean, they have not come back and said that here is the credit which I have been able to recover from the, those defaulting vendors, and this is what I am offering it back to you. Never. Similar situation. If you look at the, uh, I mean, GST Council. I think in one of the council meetings, uh, uh, council commented on that piece that it is not an automatic denial to the buyer of the goods or the services. Uh, the government would still make an effort to recover it from the defaulting vendor, and if they are not able to do so, then the 16 section 16 operation uh, comes into the play. But uh, I mean, completely. I mean, both these things or I mean aspects have been completely disregarded. uh coming back to this piece how we are tackling this i think it's both manual and uh, i mean technology driven solutions of course i mean as a large corporate uh, we have that responsibility to have that ecosystem in place wherein uh, i mean not just us even our vendors are fully compliant so uh, it, it's been a task and i mean still going on i would say that none of these solutions be it manual or technological would be able to give you a 100% solution so uh, as the rules are evolving as are we so uh, uh, i mean just to give you one example uh, i mean those uh, controls which have been built it now even for a new vendor enrollment one of the key requirements what uh, uh, we have introduced is that we need to check the compliance status of the vendor i mean fortunately these details are now uh, started to get available on the gst in portal so if you see any non compliance or uh, pending compliance for a particular vendor then it's a complete no i mean you cannot even register a vendor and i mean there would be i mean other examples like this so uh, as we evolve of course uh, uh, i mean this will further evolve payment hold back i don't think that's uh, i mean an option and uh, uh, i mean even though i would say that it may also have some conflict with uh, i mean smes and i mean msmes law because there are certain restrictions or requirements that you need to pay them within the given period of time so even the tax holding back would be an issue over there that's what uh, i feel and the legal team has given that input so i mean it's wait and watch and uh, of course at the back end we are doing our best what we can do uh, deepak your 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 input yeah uh, yes. yeah ranjit you know uh, we uh, sort of uh, our response will will number one uh, i would like to say that you know we took steps not driven by uh, uh, you know the current situation of denial of credits and restrictions you know 5% 10% but we uh, took steps which were driven by uh, other experiences for example after the first year 1718 and the last two months before september and which was later extended to march was so terrible because huge load of you know we have almost reliance across the group about 1200 registration so thousands and thousands if not lakhs of invoices lying in mismatches 
you know, some invoice number mismatch, some registration place mismatch. Twice. It was a nightmare exercise to, to get them reconciled, et cetera, uh, for three months, four months. So we took a call that time that we will avail credit only on matching. That was call number one. You know, of course, a lot of pushback from AP teams, et cetera, but uh, we stood by that call and it has proved to be so good that today we are not even concerned about the rule of 5% or 10%. You know, because we are availing credit only on the basis of matching. And believe me, it has helped in improving the discipline of the vendors also. You know, because the AP teams, if the credits are not availed, then the AP teams are pushing the vendors. Otherwise, so it becomes a post facto exercise and it's impossible to uh, get, you know, even the AP team to move. So that was step number one, which has proved to be a boon. But as I said, it was driven by other considerations. And the second step which we took was during the pandemic. Because we realized there are going to be a lot of defaulters in pandemic, people who will file the GSTR ones but not file the GSTR three B. So we started this process of compulsory releasing the payments, and luckily that API had come up by that time of uh, you know filing of GSTR three B by the vendors. So of releasing the payments to the vendors only once the three B has been filed. A lot of pushback from PNC initially, uh, and you know, and we made some exceptions because of the legal considerations for MSMEs, etc. And you know wherever it was asked for, but again that proved to be a boon because after that, from September onwards, we have seen the number of notices people are receiving for non-payment or non-filing of GSTR 3B by the vendors. You know the notices are coming to recipients. So, are virtually for the period after April 2014, uh, 2020, we've not received any notices at all. So therefore, these have been two fundamental steps which you know could be considered by anyone of taking credits only on uh, matching and releasing payments on filing of GSTR 3B. That was one. And second, of course, our compliances, uh, you know, our effort right from the beginning has been only to automate and automate. So we've been moving towards a fully, fully automated uh, uh, environment. Uh, you know, what we internally call a driverless GST. Our GSTR 1, for example, has today been filed without, across the group, without any manual intervention at all. And uh, very soon we'll have our GSTR 3B also filed without any manual intervention. You know, because what, what one has seen is if you're manually filing GSTR once, you know, you tend to miss out on one credit note or two credit notes, and which you realize at the time of GSTR 99C filing, oh boss, I uh, forgot this credit note. And then there are tax liabilities or, you know, uh, you, you lose out on credits, et cetera. So I think in this new, uh, in a transactional tax like GST, I don't think there is any other way out other than complete automation, you know, because when you're expected to report each and every transaction, when you're expected to match each and every input with the, uh, with the invoice uploaded by the vendor, uh, I, you know, technology manually, uh, there is no way, it has to be driven entirely by technology. And that is what we've been trying to, uh, to uh, you know, internally within the group. So these are the three fundamental things of handling, uh, you know, that is what uh, the approach that we've got. Thank you, Deepak. I, I noticed again and again, technology is at the forefront of it all. Uh, all, of, all, of, all of your comments and conversation is peppered with uh, technology, technology and, no, no, absolutely. It's, uh, and the reliance on it. Uh, no, no. And, you know, I'll tell you, if you ask me, that is where the biggest advantage of GST as a reform will lie. You know, Ooh. once the technology gets stabilized and taxpayers adopt that technology, it will be a, a wonderful tax system. You know, uh, in so far as compliances are concerned, I would tend to agree, uh, very much agree with you. Thank you, thank you, Deepak. Uh, Ritesh, um, what is uh, I know Deepak did mention about this, but what is your sort of positioning or view on the uh, legality of these uh, provisions and these amendments? And uh, also in that context, what what is it that uh, you know companies and uh, taxpayers should do? So that's the first uh, sort of point I would like you to touch upon. And the second one is that, uh, you know, the 2B, the matching was there for a sort of uh, uh, database to be shown from the government and, and to showcase to the sort of taxpayer. Uh, but it, it's not actually operating in that way. So how do you uh, sort of view this? So Ranjit, Deepak has aptly summarized the legality around 43A. I would not now again go into that and bore the audience on the legality. I think the key aspect is, can you challenge each and everything? Answer is no. And and probably the answer uh, lies in, in you know, what Deepak 
sort of described on technologies i would i would sort of call it a hyper technology you know to say that each and every function that happened has to be sort of governed uh, has to be happening automatically yes there are there are issues uh, deepak mentioned about uh, technology audit can everything be automated the answer is is clearly clearly no uh, vikas also touched upon uh, these challenges and uh, uh, and uh, we you know see to to a matching is something where you know even if you fully automate you would have those apprehensions but the question is you will have to you know uh, you cannot afford not to uh, adhere to this provisions because as i said you can't just go and challenge everything uh, coming to the point of uh, to be uh, see very very interesting uh, to be is a government uh, summary of you know what uh, what credit is available uh, this is just a static statement which has been issued uh the question is uh, is to be reliable at all and are we sort of expecting notices to be issued arising out of to be so for example uh, there is no mention in the act of the rules about a to be so no no provision in the gst law that is that is the first very interesting point uh the other other issue is let me just give you two illustrations on on to be very and again there are industry illustrations where you know point has sort of come to us uh, the first point is not verified but interesting to understand so this is a transaction where you know i have a vendor b who is purchased who himself has purchased goods from to vendor d and f my purchase is company a i am company a my purchases are a genuine invoice supported by back to back genuine invoice of vendor d but vendor b has also purchased certain good where unfortunately got a fake invoice of 40 so genuine invoice vendor b has paid taxes nil because against a 120 output liability he has taken a 120 credit now there is a allegation by the department against vendor b that you have taken a credit of fake of 40 the effective tax payment on this transaction therefore is only 80 because 40 is a fake credit what happens to company a in an extra to b would it mean that in an extra to b somebody would come and say sorry your credit can now only be 80 so 66% of what what you have paid to vendor b is is incorrect so we we got a call from somebody we are yet to see this instance live by ourselves but has been raised as an issue to say that this is what thing is what is happening if this happens in an extra to be this is going to be a nightmare uh the second aspect which again uh, someone called to say that late booking of invoice so let's say gst to be of number i have a gst of uh, inr 100 Uh, but in the books of account and this is a practical issue where some invoices get booked late and i have done booking of only 60 so i have taken full credit of 60 i was well within the limits of an extra uh, you know the requirement of uh, 5% 10% or 20% but in the month of december i i i had 50 books of account credit in the books of account 40 was pending which has come through whereas my reconciliation would only have 50 so and and this is happened where the when you are trying to do this the system is showing a red flag is issuing a warning to say that sorry your credit taken is far exceeding gst or 2a credit so where is that carry forward where is that cumulative concept under gst or 2a that should have been introduced right because it's not like i take it's it's not like i book the credit and i would take the credit in the same month sometimes the process has take 6 6 months so can and and the question which was raised to me after this amendment was is it a violation of section 16 leading to cancellation of a registration so the only advice that i could give is it is not a violation of registration but why don't you write a mail to gst help desk obviously there is no response from gst help desk it is quite obvious but at least put it on record so you know this kind of issues are are troubling industry more you know we have created a to be you know it should not happen that to be is considered now as a basis you mentioned about automatic filing uh, there are so many automatic return reporting filing has not started but reporting has started your invoice has started getting reported in invoice uh, your gst return huge amount of mismatches people are just wondering how this automation results so there is a 20 i mean we will go to invoicing just discuss this uh, clear over there but but you know when you implement something just be mindful of practical issues practical considerations before before you know you take it up So those those would be my my comments on JP. Thanks, thanks, Ritesh. I would totally agree, Ritesh. GSTR two B serves no purpose at all. 
you know, it, 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 it's, uh, except that you get the import data also into it. Otherwise, it cannot never it cannot match uh, with the with your uh, GSTR, you know, with the input tax credit. It's impossible. There's no. I, I don't even know why they've done this. Two A was fine. They should have just added the import details into two A. Uh, uh, you know. You're absolutely correct. It's a progress towards I, I nothing. Think. Yeah. So when people have started reaching out to us to say reconcile to be, we said just ignore. No, you can't be reconciled. No way it can be reconciled. It has to be just ignored, if you ask me. Right. Uh, uh, Umesh, uh, just wanted to ask your sort of inputs, uh, given what we've been discussing in terms of credit, uh, whether it's a mismatch, whether it's a denial, whether it's a blockage. Uh, are there any fallouts or uh, sort of implications that one would have to uh, be aware of, conscious of, and you could sort of talk about that from a from a tax, uh, from an income tax, corporate tax point of view? So, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think when we are now looking at tax, uh, you know, when you, you know, you can't look at GST as a stepson or a stepbrother. Uh, I think uh, it's all evolving into an uh, integrated system. Uh, we are yet to see the impact of, uh, uh, you know, credit mismatch matches in the, in the, on the direct tax side, but we have a section 43B, which says that, uh, uh, any deduction for tax will be allowed only on, on the actual payment. Now, whatever is the payment to be made by the company, of course, uh, that will be allowed as a deduction only on actual payment. But a part of the tax liability, the GST that we collect gets offset by, by the credit that you avail on the inputs. Now, assuming there are two angles to this, one is, one is an issue where you have uh, some inputs on which you have not made payment at all to your vendor whether the credit could be denied to you under 43b is something that 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 could uh, start uh, impacting clients also in a situation where where you have availed inputs and your vendor has not made payment of gst at all and whether the gst credit that you avail on the inputs could be denied to you again so far we we have not uh, had this problem but because we are now seeing uh, integrated actions from from the tax and uh, on the GST side, uh, especially in a situation where uh, you know there are fake invoices. I think uh, you know those these these things will start impacting corporates. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ramesh. Uh The the next topic uh, I want to talk about and and get get the views. Uh, in in a way, actually, Deepak did did clarify that uh, you know. Going into e-invoicing, implementing e bill, uh, those were actually processes they handle very, very uh, uh, easily or, or smoothly or efficiently. They didn't have, uh, you know, challenges really, so to speak. Uh, Vikas, what was your sort of uh, experience? Yeah, so um, I agree on that comment, uh, Ranjit. So uh, both e bills as well as for e-invoicing, uh, so far it has been smooth, I would say. The only thing which is yet to be clarified or maybe unclear is about this uh, B2C QR code, <clears throat> which is being talked about and has been in uh, deferment from last six months or so. I really don't get the objective of that particular provision, which seemed to be uh, a kind of driving this uh, e-payments at the retail stores on the retail sector. But uh, I mean, for uh, I mean, companies, large companies where there is no B2C transactions or very minimal as such then what purpose it's going to achieve. And somehow, uh, more you talk to the policymakers or, I mean, try to get the answer, they seem to be equally confused that what purpose it's going to serve. But uh, on an overall implementation experience, I would say that, I mean, this this has been one of the smooth, uh, smoothest uh, exercise so far. Yeah. There, okay. there are some highlights for sure. For sure then. Yeah. Of course, the recently, you know, the, again, sorry, Ranjit, to button, but uh, <clears throat> it's going absolutely smooth. Till about a month back, when they reduced that 200 100 kilometers, they increased it to 200 kilometers. Now that's a that's a you know an impossibility to miss that that for 200 kilometers you have only one day valid uh, e-way bill. Uh, you know, for particularly for large corporates where you have multimodal shipments and uh, you know uh, or milk runs as they call it that from one location for e-commerce from one hub to another hub. So it's it's a it's a big challenge. So they that's, need to can come back to the 100 kilometers. Yeah, that's that's quite harsh. I think, I think that, yeah, they may need to be revisited. Uh, that's, that's right. 
And to just to add on, in fact, last month, <clears throat> again, there were a few changes which were supposed to be introduced from 7th and there was just about a week back, uh, I mean, week before that, uh, uh, I mean, that announcement came in that you have to link in your e-invoicing reference number for generating of your e-way bill, some sort of acknowledgement number, which is not even mandatory to be put in. Uh, again, somewhere, uh, I mean, they're still thinking of tweaking it further. Uh, would it be good or bad or would it actually, uh, I mean, further complex the uh, current already settled uh, processes? You never know. But so far, I would say it's been smooth. So, so the one one sort of uh, observation I would make, uh, Vikas, in, in respect of what you just said, is, is uh, some year ago or maybe actually a little longer than that, uh, I had heard, heard about one of the economists in the system, in the current dispensation, who had said that, you know, the whole idea is to have laws, implement them, uh, design them. Uh, there may be uh, sort of wrinkles as we start. There may be wrinkles as we go along implementation. But the whole idea is at least we've got going and we've got implementation and there is result. So if there is concern, there is, you know, uh, issues which you have to sort of surface to us, please bring it up. And, uh, you know, we are happy to listen. Uh, it may, of course, not always be practicable that all things be taken to them or they respond to every one of the issues we raise. But uh, at least the mindset that seemed to be, now whether, whether you know, if I was to just take an example, whether it was RERA, whether it was IBC, whether it was GST, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the whole sort of approach to it was, uh, let's get it going. And, and in, a, in a space of time, we'll have an improvisation going along and, and you know, we'll, we'll have what we really want. Sure. And uh, I mean, I think I can very well relate this to our, uh, I mean, cricket team's performance in Australia. I mean, you have to be just there on the ground, keep facing all the bouncers and the adversities and, uh, I mean, pray that, yes, I mean, things will go in your way. Very, very apt an observation, Navika. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Ritesh, I just wanted to ask you on uh, whether there were any, you know, specific points you could, you know, talk about. In, especially uh, on on the services side for uh, e-invoicing and and uh, e-mail as as you know of it. So Ranjit, I would I would first uh, you know want to comment on what you mentioned about a wrinkle and how do you define a wrinkle becomes critical? Is it a wrinkle or is it a black hole? So that that is apart. Uh, concern on invoices, you know, service industry business practices. So there is this entire discussion on. Uh, a 24 hour timeline for auto population and a 48 hour timeline beyond which you cannot issue an invoice. You know, the typically how service industries operate is that they have time sheets and they typically would finalize those by fourth or fifth of the month and then raise an invoice. And all these invoices used to sort of get issued in that in the last day of the month. When I say last day, I mean backdated sort of invoicing. Uh, what what the law says is that it's 31st March invoice, 24 hour timeline, which means it would go into the next return. If I am not able to issue this before a first or a second, and depending upon the time in which you are doing this invoice raising, uh, would it then have interest implication? One is the government revenue gets delayed. Number two is because you have issued the invoice 31st, but it goes into your next return, will there be interest implication? So this practical reality of you know 24 hour timeline etc there has to be a cutoff so like does then do businesses have to change their practices so we let's say for example internally we are discussing do we now keep a cutoff of 27 and all the rest of the invoices would now be issued dated first yes the government revenue get delayed but so wait so so and again this 48 hour cutoff sort of relates to the very same issue another issue is you know cancellation of invoice uh, beyond 24 hour not permitted. So today, within a month, you simply cancel the invoice, don't issue a credit note. Now you will issue a credit note, do have to do a reconciliation. Uh, another challenge is, you know, partial exclusion. So banking, financial, insurance sector. What are we then achieving if there is a partial exclusion? And do we have to then again sit with the two to exercise to say that now let me do the entire reconciliation to find out what is excluded? Who, if the vendor is not complied, is it my responsibility? We have seen mails flooded from all our clients to say that, please confirm, give a declaration that you are under invoicing or not. There are there are people who might not confirm or provide such declaration. Who is, who is and if let's say he does not issue invoice, very legally bound to issue an invoice. Am I, my, can my credit be denied? These are quite untested open questions and I'm sure there, there would be challenges around these. I guess uh, time will tell again what, what our challenges really are. 
uh, I'd like to move to the sort of next topic. And prior to that, uh, we'll, we'll have another sort of poll. Uh, if you could just get that up on the screen. Yeah, what what would be the results uh, for this? Okay, expectedly uh, we we have we have a, a significant majority on on the third point, which is the the power of arrest should be curtailed, and of course uh, detailed guidelines and maybe SOPs should be formulated so that these are exercised uh, in a manner which is known. And in, of course, the rare rare circumstances that they need to be. Okay, so with with, with that, I'd like to uh, you know pose the the next question to to you, Deepak. Uh, you know, around all of all of the sort of menace of fake invoicing, and then we have arrests and and of course bail related issues and 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 in, uh, interpretational points which are you know up in various high courts and now of course the Supreme Court as well. Uh, there have been steps which have been taken to decriminalize certain types of transgressions under various laws, for example, under the Companies Act. Uh, what is your view and, and how do you, you know, sort of see these provisions and uh, uh, what is it that you believe and having, you know, maybe seen the other side as well, you can throw more perspective on that. Um, and would you, should the basis only be a reason to believe, is that a sufficient cause for arrest? Deepak, you'll, you'll have to unmute, please. Sorry. On each of the lines that you said, there could be a full discussion on that. You know, these are all very, very contentious and very important issues that uh, the country is facing. But very true. But to, just to briefly sum it up, you know, my take on the whole thing, decriminalize, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, we cannot expect it to be decriminalized any further, particularly since the serious offenses uh, are only the four clauses of uh, section 1321 abcd you know uh, which uh, which are which have been made uh, uh, cognizable and non bailable you know so which is one is issuing providing goods or service without issuing a tax invoice outright cheating you know so let's compare them to uh, uh, you know ipc offenses uh, or issuing an invoice with the only with the intention of enabling the recipient to take credit without supply of goods or services. Again, outright, you know, fraud or a cheating, et cetera. And third person taking such credit. And the fourth category, I think is, uh, which is the fourth category, Ritesh? D, uh, whatever. That is also equally serious, you know. Uh, fourth is collecting tax and not paying to the government. And not paying to the government. So all very serious, serious offenses. So if the government has made these four offenses as uh, cognizable, that is, a person can arrest, Yes, I think it is absolutely, I don't think one can fight this. Justified or not is a different matter, but one cannot fight it either in a court of law or before the policymakers, number one. Number two, coming to the point of reason to believe and whether the powers of, the, uh, powers of uh, arrest are untrammeled, yes, section 69 just gives a reason to believe to the commissioner. I think, you know, we have to, the policymakers also and you know, we have to draw out a parallel with the with the CRPC. Uh, you know, uh, because under Section 41 of the CRPC, if the punishment for a cognizable offence is less than seven years, then apart from a credible complaint, apart from the fact that a person has a reason to believe, there are other conditions also which have to be satisfied. Which is that person should be satisfied that if he's not arrested, he should person will not commit an offence again, or he will not abscond. Or he will not interfere with the uh, with, with with the evidence, etc. Or you know, uh, so those conditions are not specified under Section 69. So therefore, the powers given under Section 69 for arrest become much wider and uh, more discretionary to that extent because the maximum punishment here is only five years under 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 the GST law. So it should be made equivalent to the offences under Section 41 one of the uh, CRPC which is where the punishment is less than seven years and other safeguards are given, which inc also include that in case a person feels that he has to be arrested, he will issue a notice. And if the person 
appears in pursuance of the notice, he will not be arrested under Section 41A until and unless he records his reasons to be in writing. You know, so courts have said that 4141A safeguards apply to arrests under, uh, you know, tax laws also, but very often they are overlooked by the, uh, you know, uh, by the enforcement, uh, by the agencies. So that is one aspect of it, which needs to be codified properly so that this untrammeled uh, exercise of uh, arrest powers is curtailed. Number two, very often, and as we know, uh, you know, from our experience, both from both sides of the table, very often the arrest is used as a threat or a measure to uh, make a person pay, uh, you know, deposit immediately, deposit, cough up some amounts, or to, you know, force a person to give a statement which is not true, you know, uh, you know, against somebody else. So, which is what we have to guard against, which is what, uh, you know, nobody should be allowed, as they say, under the constitution guarantee is to be to, to, to sort of condemn yourself. So, it should not become a tool for the government or for the authorities to be able to coerce the taxpayer into giving a statement they don't want to give, number one, or into paying something which they feel is not uh, justified. You know, for example, there have been cases of late, uh, you know, of food-based drinks, whether it is a food-based pulp drink or whether it is an, you know, aerated beverage, which attracts a higher rate. So people have started paying up only, although they're strong case on merits, only because of the threat of arrests, etc. So therefore, these two trends, you know, as far as fake invoices are concerned, you know, we, we cannot hold a, uh, for hold a brief for any one of such activities that there should be no arrest. But of arrests getting used for coercing taxpayers into giving statements that they don't want to give or into coughing up payments that they feel are not warranted is what has to be avoided and for which guidelines either Section 41 of CRPC or in courts, I, you know, I think this is the line which uh, Supreme Court will also possibly take uh, when, when they decide. So, uh, you know, this is broadly my view on the whole. Of course, one can go on endlessly on this subject, but uh, briefly, yeah. Well, let, let's uh, let's hope that the Supreme Court picks up the thread that you put out on, on this yeah. right now. But Supreme Court should, I think, come out with a good balanced uh, directive in this subject. Yeah. Yeah, we, we we should all we should all hope for that and yeah, have a finger uh, Okay, uh, Umesh, I'd like to ask you. Uh, you know, once an arrest is made, uh, you know, for fake upper in, in many cases, it may just be alleged fake invoicing, and in some cases, it may be a genuine transaction that way. Uh, there is a discussion, or there is some thought that there could be other implications in in uh, you know the corporate tax uh, side of things, or the uh, enforcement directorate could possibly have a role to play. Could you uh, sort of elaborate on these and maybe talk about a few practicalities? Yeah, Ranjit. So uh, I think what we see in uh, happening on the direct tax side is that you know there are provisions which have been introduced for the levy of penalty. Uh, so if you have a false entry or a fake uh, uh, entry in your books, uh, then there is a penalty which will be equivalent to the amount of false entry. So if there is a fake invoice of 100, uh, in addition to the exposure that a person or the SSC would have uh, on the GST side, there, there could be a uh, equivalent amount of penalty which is uh, uh, there in the in the on the direct tax side. Uh, moving further, uh, there are also provisions for prosecution, and the provisions for prosecution they are uh, wide enough to cover you know various things. Uh, willful attempt to evade tax. So, moment you've introduced a false uh, uh, invoice or a false. Uh, uh, transaction in your books, then there could be a willful attempt to evade tax. Uh, if you are giving a wrong statement, there is a separate penalty under 277. Uh, if you are a supplier of a fake invoice, uh, which will lead somebody else to uh, evade tax and irrespective of whether that other person has evaded tax or no, but moment you have supplied a false invoice, then as a supplier of the false invoice, there is a penalty a, a prosecution that is uh, applicable to you. The last dimension is that uh, you are only abating all these uh, uh, transactions. Even if you are abating such transactions, there is there is a, a consequence in terms of a prosecution. And the prosecution provisions, uh, depending upon the quantum of of the uh, transaction involved, could be you know three months, and it can extend up to seven years. Uh, in compounding, you know, just without without getting too much into the technical. 
Uh, there are two types of compounding uh, offenses. One is type A and type B. Now all this bogus entries, false invoices will will be a type uh, B compounding. I mean, uh, which cannot get uh, uh, you know you get only once in a in a uh, lifetime to you know compound. And some of these provisions, uh, even compounding, may not be possible. Uh, what we see also is that uh, you know the the current news articles are saying that you know the uh, both the the central excise as well as the direct tax uh, they are taking uh, concerted actions and the effort is also to bring in uh, PMLA. Uh, PMLA is largely uh, where there are proceeds of crime, but moment there is a cash element which is involved. Now where the cash element is touching uh, because it, for every crime there is there is a money trail and if if the money trail passes through. Uh, you know, proceeds of crime, then there could be a possibility of uh, action under PMLA. Well, so I think one has to be very, very mindful of, uh, you know, of what, what uh, you do and how you record your entries and what your transactions are. Uh, oh, uh, uh, indeed, just to add one again, uh, you know, one, way, one very uh, sort of uh, draconian provision under GST, which was not there possibly under any of the tax laws, is section 135, which says that, you know, in case of a prosecution of an offense under GST Act, the if it requires a guilty state of mind, it shall be presumed that the person is guilty, you know, till he proves otherwise, you know, it's like a strict liability, as you have under Prevention of Food Adulteration Act or something, right. you know, so there's a presumption as to the guilt of a person, uh, and he has to prove it otherwise beyond reasonable doubt. So, you know, this has still not come into play, but this will be a, uh, you know, a very tough provision of law to overcome uh, subsequently very, very, the very, prosecutions come in there very rightly said uh, highly onerous and and will 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 prove tough i, I do see what you're saying uh, uh, ritesh i know it's it's extremely uh, little time but could i just request you to you know summarize and and truly summarize uh, what is it that the judicial position is right now you know given that we have the andhra pradesh high court saying something the bombay high court taking a different set of view or, or then maybe the Supreme Court having given some directions on the entire aspect of arrest and, and uh, bail. So Ranjit, I will, I will call it as a judicial dilemma right now where, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the decision in PV Ramana Reddy was dismissed by the Supreme Court and, and uh, you know, the Supreme Court observations in Tapna Jain to say that, ki, you know, please be mindful of what the Supreme Court has done in PV Ramana Reddy. Uh, what is what we are seeing now is a multiple high court decisions which are outright rejecting the bail of an arrested person seeing and and the way this is being portrayed is on the newspaper to say that these are large economic offenses Deepak mentioned about you know the white collar crime fake invoicing actual fake invoicing completely agree and understand the point is if a person is participating cooperating in an inquiry then why should there be a judicial custody you know the entire crpc law around it but and and again you know the 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 position which is being taken is to say that no adjudication is required so you don't have to go through the rigors of 73 74 you know make my trip to union of india where the arrest was made because of an interpretation issue to say that i am collecting tax on behalf of my supplier what if an arrest is made arising out of that interpretation issue is it not warranted that there has to be first an adjudication and assessment and then the prosecution provision should follow so see initial investigation over zealous officers coming to a conclusion, you know, without, you know, so one month, month you do an investigation in your arrest. I think those are, those are the areas which, which, which are creating a sort of a fear in minds of the taxpayer to say that even if I'm doing everything right, you know, tomorrow, somebody could come and say that, look, I have violated the provisions of the law 132 and I, I could be, and these are all interpretation issues, right? You could debate it and that that's the, the worry which and so guidelines I, I think is, is a must to say that when should this be sort of initiated that that's most critical to my view. Thanks Ajay. Uh, because could I have your uh, your sort of last word on this uh, you know fake invoicing and all of these uh, issues are of course uh, undesirable and, and you know uh, unfortunate. But uh, there are provisions and then there are sort of uh, outcomes in terms of arrest and, and whatnot. Uh, do, you, do you have a feeling or do you see it as causing a larger sort of problem to industry? And, and I mean at industry at large, 
does it does it cause more worry uh, you know we've been talking about certain draconian provisions and 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 variety of things how do you uh, you know what is your take on it so i mean seriously of course it, it's an issue which needs to be addressed and uh, uh, to an extent government is also right because uh, when you come out with these kind of instances where uh, uh, these fake invoices menaces which is going on on such a large scale basis of course that creates the question mark on the entire taxpayers community and that's where it is happening because based on maybe those uh, uh, 5 to 10% of those uh, category of taxpayers the i mean stricter rules or the consequences it's the i mean entire tax community which is facing be it the professionals be it the companies or the honest taxpayers so uh, if you look at it uh, maybe you can divide the taxpayers into two categories uh, i mean for all taxpayers in india one is this compliant taxpayers the other one is not so compliant one and uh, i mean both of them would be in some sort of uh, uh, unhappy situation because the first category if you say someone who is compliant they are uh, i mean unhappy because of this overburdened compliances over regulation and uh, i mean so many things which are coming in on a frequent basis which of course uh, i mean uh, for companies uh, which are fully compliant they have to follow the law of the land and uh, i mean the other set of it is when you say who are non compliant for them of course nothing matters so unless they come to a situation where there is a threat or they are uh, under arrest uh, I mean, they will not follow the law so effectively then it's the cost of those non compliant people which is getting uh, i mean borne by those compliant tax taxpayers be it the uh, i mean the tax rates i would say those i mean stricter compliances these rs provisions these restrictions on the credits now where do we balance it out then that's where the big question mark comes in one thing which maybe uh, uh, i mean my suggestion could be that uh, government also needs to look at the track record or the history of the taxpayers now if a company or if a particular taxpayer who has been in operation for let's say 30 years 40 years or given whatever time frame the government can define of course you cannot compare a same taxpayer into or with someone who is just uh, maybe few months or uh, one or two years old into the system in the tax regime so they cannot put everyone in the same basket to say that uh, uh, if my credits are not matching you will also follow the same consequences what someone who is just got into the system so i mean they have to differentiate between maybe a man and i mean a just new born baby and i mean that is as good as a, as if uh, uh, they have to differentiate otherwise what will happen we will continue to have the same sort of uh, i mean stricter measures consequences and this mistrust which is being talked about so much in the media and from the revenue authorities fair point uh, vikas i i do agree with you completely that there has to be a distinction and and that sword sort of hanging cannot be for everyone and anyone there has to be a sort of guideline and and clear cut definition of where and when so uh, thank you thank you for that uh, vikas uh, i think we are we are coming to uh, you know we are actually exceeded time but uh, i would like to take the last topic and and you know sort of quickly uh, have have uh, inputs on that from ritesh uh, prior to that we'll we'll just also have uh, uh, thoughts from the audience in terms of the the poll result yes could we uh, get get the outcome of this so itesh uh, there you are uh, you know can you can you talk to us a little about the convergence uh, that that seems to be a favorite topic of yours and and uh, you know with that we would then come to a conclusion of this uh, webinar Ritesh, you need to unmute, please. You know, these are these are boxes which we have practically seen as to why I cannot take up only on indirect taxes and completely ignore direct taxes or other regulations. So the first thing is your entire uh, GST audit, which talks about reconciliation with the books of accounts, uh, turnover under GST versus books, uh, improper GST credit. Umesh spoke about versus disallowance of expenditure under income tax. you know the concept of fixed place pe under income tax versus the fixed establishment that you have an office in india or not 26 years and notices which we are receiving on reverse chart to say that 
if you have deducted TDA, why have you not paid reverse charge? Uh, TCS, uh, you know, the recently introduced TCS provision under income tax, and now the, though the languages are different, clearly, you know, sort of creating issues in terms of you know, the, the income tax provisions are very, very wide. But if you have not deducted TCS, that could raise apprehension of why have you not deducted under TCS under GST. Valuation, we all know open market value versus arm length, synonymous concept. So when you when you decide to value a transaction between related parties and domestic uh, valuation is not there, but for cross border transactions more specifically, transfer pricing report would be looked at. Intermediary under GST, you know, arranging facilitating versus an agency P. So intermediary is somebody who assists, facilitates, and achieves in the conclusion of a transaction. On an agency P also there are there are discussions to say that I am merely a facilitator, I do not conclude. They are completely aligned, right? You can't take a view under income tax to say that I'm an agency PN under GST to say that I'm not an intermediary. Recently, we saw notices quoting saying BEPS provision to say that equalization levy has been introduced. BEPS is there. Why are you not registered in India and paying tax under OIDAR, online information database for a non resident taxpayer? Characterization of service. You've taken a view on withholding tax, TDS under income tax. What is the characterization of services under GST? It can't be different, right? I'm one end I'm saying this is royalty on software. I can't say other end that this is royalty on some other services because the rates could be different, 12%, 18%. Exemption under income tax versus GST. Very interesting recent example where we were debating on low cost housing exemption. And under GST, if you have combined projects, you could go under a low subcontracting rate. Under income tax, the view was that if you have distinct registration for the projects, so we sort of came to a conclusion that you know from an income tax and a GST perspective, have distinct registration for low cost project, though even though the consequence is a higher subcontract rate. So you can't look at laws in science. These are just a few examples that we have come across. And the point is, uh, you know, you can't look at laws in silos. So this is income tax and indirect tax, but speak about regulation where we have seen that if you have to take a view on GST, you will have to see regulation. RBI regulations on NBFC, uh, the insurance ID regulations for insurance company. You can't give a view which is completely misaligned to you know the direct tax laws and regulations. And what digitalization is doing is bringing everything, making the world very small. Uh, you know we we've seen IC applications where you have to they go to see a website and verify the names of the directors. Uh, so so Ranjit, uh, the, the point is. Uh, you know, to my view, it is one 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 law, one evolving law, one tax team. Uh, gradually, probably the uh, tax authorities will also align. They have started aligning. We saw the news on this. Uh, so it's important for for uh, you know uh, indirect tax heads to sort of uh, align with their counterparts to take a consistent view across. Uh, you know that that would uh, uh, be my 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 sort of. Uh, suggestion well uh, i think that's that's a that's a you know very useful for closing remark from your side to so to the, to the attendees uh, with this i'd i'd like to say uh, thank you gentlemen for the uh, extremely sharp and insightful comments you all have made uh, during the course of this webinar uh, especially i would like to thank uh, mr deepak garg and and Mr. Vikas Garg for their time and you know agreeing to sort of join us today and and give us their uh, insights and inputs on all of these uh, I, I would say contemporaneous issues not burning issues uh, so thank you so much and and uh, for the questions we couldn't take on the sort of uh, chat box we'd we'd come back to them uh, independently um, so we won't let them go unanswered thank you thank you for joining us today thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you, everyone.